the pleasure of introducing our speakers for this morning. Um, I thought we had two speakers. Turns out we have more than two speakers, um, but I will uh, introduce our first two speakers and allow them to introduce the subsequent um, speakers. So first we have Dr. Jim King, um, very well known to us all. Uh, Jim received his medical degree from Memorial University in 1985 and completed his pediatric residency training at University of Ottawa and CHEO in 1990. He completed his teaching fellowship in 1991 and then was appointed to staff uh, at CHEO in 1992. Following this, he obtained a master's of science degree in epidemiology uh, at the University of Ottawa in 1994. And perhaps this wasn't quite enough training for Jim, so he went back and completed certification in health informatics at the University of Waterloo in 2003. He was the chief for the Division of Pediatric Medicine from 1995 to 2006 and president of medical staff from 2007 to 2010. He is currently the medical director for informatics at CHEO and his scholarly activity is focused on injury control and the application of evidence-based medicine and health informatics to pediatric patient safety. And as everyone knows, he's been a major leader um, in, uh, in EPIC um, and has really helped bring it um, to life successfully for us at CHEO. Uh, our second speaker, Dr. Ellen Goldblum, uh, received her medical degree from Dalhousie University in 2004 and completed her pediatric residency and pediatric endocrinology fellowship at the University of Ottawa and CHEO, uh, all finished in 2010. She joined the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at CHEO in 2011 um, and has been one of our really great shining stars in this really strong division. She has clinical interest in general endocrinology. Her research administrative and quality improvement interests have included uh, include adrenal suppression, transition from pediatric to adult care, and delivery of care, including the option and optimization of electronic medical records secure patient portals and virtual care. And this is the area that, um, that Ellen has really thrived in and will be discussing further with us today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over, I believe to Jim, who's gonna lead things off for us and um, they will introduce the subsequent speakers. Take it away, Jim. Thanks, Mona. Um, and I'd like to thank our, uh, the co-presenters for rounds today. Um, you mentioned Ellen, but also we have uh, Melanie Buba, Catherine Delude and Balabat who are uh, helping us. And uh, also just wanna make mention that there, we have no conflicts of interest uh, to uh, disclose uh, for this presentation. Uh, our overview is to talk about our virtual care journey at CHEO, some of our unique programs um, uh, for our virtual emergency department and our virtual family centered rounds, and also to uh, present our virtual care evaluation framework plan. So I wanted to start off with just a few thoughts around virtual care. Um, virtual care um, uh, for us at CHEO, in 2019, we did a total of 504 telemedicine visits. Um, we've completely upended that, and Ellen will speak more about, uh, about CHEO's uh, uh, experience over the last year and the COVID influence on that. Uh, but many organizations were already um, um, well into virtual care. And in 2014, Kaiser Permanente had completed 40% of their visits uh, uh, vir vir virtually. Uh, next slide, Ellen, please. Um, I think the first thought that I wanted to mention is we're, we're not in the business of telemedicine or the business of in-person visits. Um, I, I think it's important for us to realize that we're in the business of caring. and. You know, caring is the provision of what is necessary for the health, maintenance, and protection of somebody or something. And I think it's very important for us to keep that in mind as we go through any of these uh, um, um, processes and looking at how we're providing that care. Um, and, and virtual care itself is not new. This is uh, an example of a slow scan uh, TV uh, setup that I, I was introduced to in the 1980s um, in, uh, in Newfoundland. And uh, Max House, who is the former uh, um, president, um, uh, uh, de dean of medicine and president of the university, um, also was a founder of the medical school. Um, he, he had actually started a program in the 1970s that ran well into the 1990s around virtual care, uh, specifically around uh, transmission of uh, um, imaging from the offshore oil, oil rigs. 
Um, also, uh, even virtual care predated this, uh, a letter to the Lancet in 1879 after the um, uh, introduction of the telephone, a physician anonymously um, um, uh, discussed uh, their uh, uh, telling a parent over the phone that their child did not have croup uh, and allowed both of them to sleep soundly, apparently through, through, through the night. And then in the 1920s, uh, Hugo uh, Grinsback uh, did a lot of work around um, uh, the potential future uh, of uh, how telemedicine might be used. And he had a teledactyl that he was proposing where you could actually examine the patient remotely, um, but uh, uh, had been publishing a number of documents around the potential future for using the radio to provide uh, virtual care. The other thought I just wanted to mention, and this relates well with the uh, what we're in the business of, is telemedicine is a disruptive technology, and and the analogy I want to draw is to uh, sailing ships. Uh, so you know, uh, part of our advance in civilization was uh, uh, the ability to transport goods over long distances uh, across uh, sea sea channels. In the early 1800s, Robert Fulton made the first steamboat uh, that uh, traveled uh, between New York City and Albany at a five mile per hour clip. Um, the, the, he was basically the sailing ship uh, um, companies sort of laughed at this technology and said that it would never replace the uh, sleek, fast sailing ships. Um, until 1819, uh, when the technology had improved and the uh, SS Savannah made the first transatlantic crossing. Uh, there was still resistance from uh, uh, the uh, uh, sailing ship companies, but by the early 1900s, every one of those companies had gone out of, uh, out of business. They, they didn't realize that they weren't in the sailing ship business, they were actually in the transportation business, uh, uh, and uh, an important uh, uh, point for thinking about how, how they were providing uh, their business necessity. And this is an example of how uh, virtual care can be disruptive. So this is, I don't know if you've heard of Babylon Health, but Babylon Health is a provider of virtual services in, uh, in England. And in 2016, they bought Dr. Jeffries and Partners uh, practice in Fulham. And within three years became the fifth largest practice in uh, uh, the uh, national health system in England. Um, they almost uh, bankrupt the uh, uh, Hammersmith and Fulham Trust uh, because they had enrolled so many patients so uh, so 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 quickly. Interestingly, this is a class one medical device. It has very little need for regulatory oversight and control, or for providing evidence about the safety uh, for the uh, application. And it strikes a very specific demographic because it's basically been recruiting patients between the ages of about 20 to 25 to about 40 years old who are relatively well and just want to do symptom checking. Um, there's been a number of, uh, and Ellen, you can just go through these slides, there's been a number of uh, the Royal College, the uh, British Medical Association, and the Royal College of, uh, of Physicians and General Practitioners have all come out against uh, these types of technologies, stating that they will never replace uh, uh, GPs uh, um, at hand uh, uh, provision of care. And there, there's been one study that's looked at the ability of it uh, to be able to, to do uh, digital symptom checking that found that it's not actually that, uh, that good. Despite that, the NHS has actually endorsed um, uh, GP at hand and um, Babylon Health has made inroads into uh, major practice in New York City and also uh, with uh, TELUS, um, Go to the next slide, uh, Ellen. Um, uh, with uh, TELUS as a provider for Babylon Health in Canada, and they've actually uh, um, opened up uh, offices in both BC and Alberta, and to a slower, smaller extent in Ontario. So, uh, uh, despite the lack of evidence, uh, they are proceeding uh, quite uh, quickly as far as uh, market uptake. The other part too is um, when uh, um, the uh, steamships were uh, advancing their, uh, their cause, they, they didn't do it in the mainstream. Uh, they sort of went uh, uh, external a bit to the normal provision of, uh, of goods transportation. Um, and and you, know, you have to think, what if you had an Uber app for medicine? So, so Apple Watch uh, and uh, its telehealth applications are starting to do that. And a few years ago when I presented on this, 
I wasn't quite sure where they were going, but um, I, I think they've actually started uh, on, on a really uh, uh, exciting track. And this is an uh, uh, article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, looking at uh, the ability of a smartwatch to identify atrial fibrillation. This was a small study uh, done out of Stanford, and there's a large study now that's being run by Johnson & Johnson uh, Pharmaceuticals uh, in um, um, together with uh, Apple um, and looking at using the uh, atrial fibrillation detector to prevent stroke. And, and Apple has uh, partnered with Athena and United Healthcare. Um, they are in conversations with, uh, with CMS and as I mentioned with Johnson & Johnson or Jensen uh, Pharmaceuticals. And basically if the app detects that you're having atrial fibrillation, it'll come up on your phone. The phone will make a recommendation to connect to a physician which will be provided virtually. That physician will confirm what the actual uh, ECG uh, or what the recording is showing that you are at risk for atrial fibrillation, and then we'll make uh, uh, um, then we'll make recommendations for next steps for for care. It's believed that this could save as much as three billion dollars U.S. Uh, every year in the prevention of uh, of stroke. Uh, atrial fibrillation is the number one cause of preventable stroke in the U.S. So just to circle back, um, I, I, uh, my final thought is I do believe telemedicine will become a standard of care. Um, if you look at the uh, relief uh, that I showed at the start, uh, basically this is uh, 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 Hippocrates uh, treating a patient. Um, the patient's in a dream state where they, um, a, a snake has bitten them and, and actually um, started to cure them, but what they actually believe is that Hippocrates is doing this. But if you notice in the upper uh, right-hand portion of the uh, uh, relief, I, I think that's a video monitor, and uh, they were probably uh, telling us that uh, virtual care was uh, uh, going to be coming uh, in, in the future. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, uh, Ellen uh, for the next uh, part of our presentation. Great. Thanks, Jim, for providing that contact. So, you know, for all these reasons listed here and, and what Jim has explained, I, I think it's obvious to all of you that the question is not why, but how. Um, and I'm happy to say that, you know, CHEO was well on its way to actually establishing and formalizing the virtual care strategy before the pandemic. Um, we had partnered with the Ontario Telehealth Network and we're using HVV or home video visits and uh, piloting in endocrinology and mental health. And we through those pilots, we evaluated um, and we saw a lot of benefits to the patients, their caregivers, their providers, to kilometers saved, but also came up against a lot of barriers and obstacles. And that allowed us an opportunity to work through those. And overall, we really felt that, you know, the pros definitely outweighed the cons. And we were trying, you know, to get people on board to make this a part of our normal care. But, you know, change is hard and we were moving at a really slow pace. Um, and then, this happened. Um, so then we had no choice. Everybody had to ramp into fast forward uh, to start to deliver virtual care. And so this really put the pressure on CHEO to really uh, formalize and solidify that virtual care strategy. Um, and much of this work has really been led by Karen McCulley, Jen Gillert, um, and Britton Fell. Um, these are just a few of the facilitators to, uh, that have helped to get us to where we are today in terms of virtual care at CHEO. So we now have a formalized leadership team, virtual care leadership team that is um, ingrained within our governance structure. Um, but you know, this started off as I think, you know, March 14th, maybe uh, 8 a.m. meetings every day to just sort of put out fires as we tried uh, to make this work and continue to do what we do in our, in our new um, context. And then over time, these daily 8 a.m. meetings uh, developed into our more formal leadership team. Um, there are, have been several information systems and epic optimi optimizations that have really helped us in this. One key thing that I wanted to point out is I think we uh, can all agree that integrating Zoom into our electronic health record has been really great. Um, most hospitals actually do have Zoom or some, some sort of platform embedded within their EHR, but they require all of their patients to be on the portal to use it. And that was really a non-starter for us because we didn't want to have this available only to some people. And people have good reasons for not signing up for MyChart. For example, the adolescent who doesn't wanna share all of their health information with their parent. So we have two separate workflows that allows all of our patients to use this technology. 
That said, we did want to ramp up our MyChart activation and enrollment because MyChart is really a great tool to engage patients and families before and after their visits. And it's a great way to electronically allow this transfer of information that might have otherwise or previously been done in person, for example, handing someone their after visit instructions. And proud to say that our MyChart enrollment has soared and we're at, we have 50,000 uh, unique patients live on MyChart now. Um, E-faxing sounds like a simple thing and it's something we've wanted for a long time, um, but the IS team was great in getting that up and running and now we can send uh, prescriptions for supplies and medications directly to pharmacies through Epic. And this one seems like a small thing, but makes a huge difference. So within our follow-up order, we added a button, a few buttons that allow us to indicate whether we want the follow-up visit to be in person or Zoom. And what that does is it triggers a conversation between the provider and their patient to really figure out whether that next follow-up visit is it most appropriate based on the clinical situation, provider preference, patient preference, what is the most appropriate way to deliver that care? Um, and something that we've added more recently is an extra button, we're all about buttons, um, which is whether the location of that visit is flexible. And that's proved really useful. So for example, I might think it's optimal to see my patient in person next time, but I still think seeing them virtually would be better than nothing if, for example, they're in isolation or they're sick. So I can click that button and when they call to cancel the day before because they failed the screening, um, the clerk can say, oh, actually, we'll just convert that to virtual and then we've avoided a cancellation and we've improved patient care. Lots of tools and resources um, have been created and are available on our internet, also on our external website. We've really ramped up our operational support uh, for virtual care. Um, and some of the highlights in terms of some really exciting stories in terms of innovation and creativity. You know, there are clearly clinical areas where virtual care just can't replace it. So a surgery, a procedure, but there were several types of visits, um, particularly in ambulatory care, where there was just one small component of the visit that made people say, no, we can't do it because we need them to come in for this. And diabetes is a perfect example. Most of our care, we really, we can do quite well virtually, but we were really missing that point of care hemoglobin A1C that tells us about their blood sugar control for the past three months. But it seems silly to have them come into clinic, you know, for an hour or more. And so we created this drive-through uh, A1C clinic where they pull up to the back of CHEO, stick their finger out the window, get a capillary sample, and we get their hemoglobin A1C result. A similar model in mental health, um, where most of the care provision can be done virtually, but we do need to measure vitals to, you know, if they're on particular medications, for example. We actually created a new visit type in endocrinology where we were feeling like we could do much of our care virtually, but based on that virtual encounter, we might say, oh, we really can't make a complete assessment unless we have that height, weight, or pubertal exam. So we created these auxology clinics where patients would come in just for that. And it was just a very efficient and effective way to deliver care. And so in terms of our current state, we have uh, several different platforms that are available, but really most people using Zoom that is integrated within Epic. We have virtual care up and running in really the majority of our clinical areas. And you'll hear more about that from, um, from Dr. Malabat, Dr. Mel Buba, and Catherine Delude. And on the right, you can see an updated picture of our virtual care dashboard, which just shows you how prevalent virtual care is across the hospital. If you look back to um, our numbers starting at the beginning of the pandemic, you can see, you know, when, when everything shut down, we had no choice but to pivot almost completely to virtual care, um, providing 75% of our ambulatory uh, care visits virtually. And then that dropped as things opened up and we've stabilized just below 50%, which is our operational goal. But what you don't see here, which has really changed is that at the beginning, it was really mostly telephone visits. And as we made it more streamlined to be able to provide care through video visits, Visits, the proportion of video visits has increased dramatically. And that's important because we feel it's a better way to deliver care. It provides that extra element of communication and interaction. Also, it's felt to be more sticky, something that's probably more sustainable for several reasons, including possibly from a billing perspective that perhaps we don't know what the billing landscape will look like, um, but chances are that that will be more acceptable than telephone visits. 
And I'm, you're not meant to see all of these numbers, but just to show you that within Epic, we created a dashboard that really gives you a nice dynamic overview of what's happening in terms of virtual care in the hospital. Um, so you can see it's divided by outpatient on the left, emergency department in the middle and inpatient on the right. And I'll just highlight that this is actually up to date as of yesterday. And you can see we had 1200 ambulatory visits, 500 were in person, over, um, so closer to six or 700 were virtually, and the bulk of those were done as video visits. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Malabat to tell you what we've done in our emergency department. Thanks, Ellen. Um, so I'm here representing um, the ED virtual care build team, which was um, uh, myself, Sandy C, Sarah Reed, and Roger Zemek in collaboration with IS. And then that team has actually expanded to include many more of our emergency department colleagues as we implemented and iteratively um, updated our platform. So uh, I'm gonna take you back to the beginning of the pandemic uh, in March, 2020, when we were worrying about a lot of things in the emergency department. We were learning about COVID. We were learning how to care for these sick patients, um, revamping our resuscitation protocols. Um, but what we really had not bargained for was the dramatic decrease in ED visits that we were seeing. On this graph, you see um, April 2019 visits up on the top in the light blue line, and then the April 2020 visits down on the bottom in the darker blue line. Um, and as you can see, we were used to seeing 200 or more patients every day in a usual year, but this has dropped down to 60 to 80 patients none of us had really anticipated how significant and sustained the decrease in ED volumes would be. Um, next slide. So we became really concerned about where these patients were. With the schools and daycare, um, daycares being closed and organizational sports on hold, we could account for some of the decrease in patient volumes um, as a result of uh, decreased exposure to viruses and less opportunity to injure themselves because everybody was at home and not playing organized sports. But the more acutely ill kids were also not in our emergency departments and we became really concerned about where these children were. Um, we were. We were afraid that the patients and families were not coming to the hospital because of fear of being exposed to COVID and they were choosing to stay home over seeking medical care. So we started to hear that this phenomenon that we were experiencing was a global phenomenon. ED patient volumes were down uh, all over the world from Australia to the UK to South America and in the US. Um, and they were down a significant amount just like we were observing. Um, there have been lots of papers published um, in the interim showing that there were delayed presentations of um, things like appendicitis and type one diabetes, new presentations of type one di diabetes leading to patient uh, morbidity, increased patient morbidity. But around this time, the province had also um, encouraged virtual care and telemedicine with policy and funding. So we decided to leverage the virtual visits that were already happening in virtual care as Ellen was just telling us about um, to create another option for care. We wanted children and families to have high access, access to high quality um, pediatric care for their acute health care concerns. Um, so with that, with the amazing support of the CHEO IS team, we created the Virtual Pediatric Emergency Department, which we call VPED, um, and this was the first in Canada. Um, at the beginning of the design phase, we really had to reimagine what a self-referral emergency department would look like. So while we encouraged fam uh, families to seek care with their primary caregiver if they had one, they, we also asked them to go through a checklist of, um, of symptoms or signs to see to really weed out whether their child had a higher acuity condition that should be seen in person in the emergency department. For example, um, fever in a young infant or signs of severe infection um, or injuries that would almost certainly need a physician for assessment. But if they didn't have one of these more acute problems, um, we deemed that virtual care was a good option for them. And then they were asked to fill out a triage form, which provided us um, with information that a doctor would need um, about the reason for their visit. 
And I wanted to highlight that this is the big difference with emergency department virtual care compared to the other forms of care that are happening in our hospital. These visits are triggered by families and responded to by the hospital. Whereas um, in ambulatory care, um, the patient is known to the service and the visit is triggered by us as the physician and responded to by the families. So it was a whole different type of workflow um, that we had to engage. So on May 4th of 2020, we launched our virtual emergency department. And since that time, over 5,000 children have received care on this platform. And of those 5,000 children, there were just over 15% um, of patients who have used the service more than once. Next slide. And while we have a lot of outcomes and lessons learned um, over this past year, uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on the evaluation portion um, for the next couple of minutes. Since the virtual pediatric emergency department was a new endeavor and the design was based on really a best guess on how to serve children and families, we designed a post-care survey that was sent to the caregiver along with discharge instructions. So these are sent to every patient who's seen in the emergency department because we can't actually close their chart until the um, discharge instructions have been emailed to them and embedded in that is this post-care survey. Um, the survey collected information on who is accessing care, caregiver satisfaction, both with the technology and the medical care, and we also solicited ideas for improvement. Um, and overwhelmingly, the experience was positive for families and patients. 99% reported that they would use emergency department virtual care again. They gave us a 9.6 on 10 global rating, um, and 94% said their concerns were fully addressed. I could also add that um, about 85% of patients were able to be cared for solely in the virtual department and about just under 15% were referred into the department for care. And we were not unhappy with that number because the, per the whole purpose of this was to allow patients to seek care um, if they didn't wanna leave their home and for us to be able to judge whether um, they needed to go in or not and to provide them with that reassurance. So um, in September of 2020, uh, the province had recognized that virtual urgent care was an importance to the population during this pandemic and was already being provided in various forms across the province. They sent out a funding call in September um, and announced the results in December uh, for applications from emergency departments across Ontario uh, for people who wanted to offer virtual care or improve the care that they were already providing. CHEO uh, submitted an application. It was led by Gina and Sandy, and we were very fortunate to be one of the 16 departments funded um, and one of three pediatric um, sites. So with this funding, we were able to make some improvements in terms of our evaluation. Um, as you recall from a couple of slides ago, we had patients and families read through a list of conditions um, to see whether their child met these conditions or not to decide whether they um, were referred, they should go and present in person to the emergency department. But we had no idea how many patients or families landed on this page, went through the whole list, and then followed up with an appointment or started abandoned. Um, and so we had no idea um, if, if, if this actual self triage process was working. Now we have this fillable form where we are able to track um, the people who go through the entire process and um, um, trigger a visit or if they abandon that. With this information, we really hope to be able to understand whether um, where our community needs may lie and how we might better meet the needs of our community. Our post-care evaluation has also evolved with this funding. Um, we're now participating in a provincial assessment of virtual care, which is also in survey format and is embedded in that same um, email uh, that is sent to families at the conclusion of the visit. This um, 
survey is a little bit more robust in um, understanding whether virtual care has met um, the caregiver and patient's needs. And it's being led by Shelley McLeod and Katie Dainty. Both of these women are scientists um, from Toronto. Uh, Shelley's from uh, Mount Sinai and Katie Dainty is from uh, North York General. We just started to participate um, at the beginning of April and we're really looking forward to seeing these results as um, for us on our own, but also in comparison to the other pediatric centers that are offering virtual care. So what does the post-pandemic uh, virtual pediatric emergency department look like? Um, we, we know that, it's, um, that it will stay um, and we think that it will evolve over time to, to um, to continue to fill this gap for families. We don't uh, still understand um, about the equity of this platform. Are all members of our community served by this video virtual platform? And that is something that um, is yet to be determined. Um, we also see it as a solution, uh, perhaps one day if our uh, volumes do return to normal, as a way to offset some of our non-urgent or low acuity visits that we were um, trying to di divert. If you remember uh, pre-pandemic, we were looking to divert a substantial number of those patients. So this could be the answer to that as well. Thank you, Mala. Uh, so we'll hand it over to uh, Melanie Buba and Catherine Delu to talk about what's happening, what has happened and is happening on the inpatient side. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so uh, Melanie and I are sharing today work that was really multidisciplinary team effort, as we've heard um, from, uh, from everyone else so far. Lots of engagement from nursing and physician teams, pediatric medicine admins, and our unit clerks, and a lot of support from IS. Um, but uh, in brief, uh, in April 2020, we started working on virtual care options for inpatients um, in an effort to maintain physical distancing and preserve PPE. And this was kicked off really by executive leadership asking for virtual family-centered rounds to avoid many people in close proximity at bedsides and in the hallways. And one year later, uh, unfortunately, we still uh, need this uh, workflow, um, and it is now also being used as a workforce preservation measure. Uh, and so that's really what we'll focus on today. But before we get to that uh, virtual family-centered rounds development, um, in addition to virtual family-centered rounds, staff asked for virtual visits and multi-D meetings to facilitate virtual consults or follow-ups where a physical exam was not required. Um, and today that is regularly used uh, by psychology and others. Um, and virtual multi-D meetings with or without patients uh, are also well used and include, um, for example, uh, reviewing images with radiology team or bringing in offsite family who are otherwise not able to participate in care. And more recently, we have implemented um, virtual family visits for adult patients and PICU, really a kudos to CHIO in this area as it allowed uh, the family to see their loved ones for the first time after more than a week of admissions at other hospitals. So um, definitely virtual care appreciated on the inpatient side. Uh, Family-centered rounds at CHIO, uh, as many of you are aware, is a daily opportunity to bring together the multidisciplinary care team to ensure shared understanding of patient current status and plan of care. And the goal is to maintain team situation awareness and facilitate shared decision making. It's a focused 10 minute discussion on the, uh, the medicine units per patient, uh, 10 minutes, that follows established content and defers teaching and longer discussions to another time um, as much as possible. Um, for example, translation would you know not prolong rounds. We would try and do that uh, in a separate meeting. Um, uh, next slide, Ellen. Many of us are familiar with the roaming multidisciplinary team of uh, eight or more people. And so in April 2020, we launched a project with the objective to maintain family-centered rounds while adhering to public health recommendations and preserving PPE. And our aim was to use available telemedicine technologies to create and implement a virtual model of family-centered rounds that adhere closely to our institutionally accepted in-person family-centered rounds workflow, specifically facilitating multidisciplinary participation in a safe and cost-effective way. And our hypothesis in doing so was that um, this virtual family-centered rounds uh, would be effective, useful, and acceptable to stakeholders. And so the picture on the right is a little bit 
uh, of what our new process looks like now. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thanks. <laughs> so how does it work? Um, uh, the admin set up uh, Zoom accounts for each of the three physician teams, uh, pediatric medicine teams, with recurrent daily rounds, um, Zoom meetings as a static meeting ID, and Outlook calendar invites are sent to the physician team, uh, MRPs and residents, with a Zoom login information for the team so that they can host the meeting. And then everyone else, uh, nursing, healthcare professionals, pharmacy unit clerks, get um, a link to join that meeting. Daily, the unit clerks will prepare and share the rounding schedule uh, uh, schedule of nurses and patients by 8.30 a.m. They set up two iPads for each team, one for the nurse, one for the patient and family on a rolling table with cleaning supplies and tip sheets, and they join the Zoom meeting um, on the iPads. Uh, and then they announce over the uh, over the PA the start of units, uh, the start of rounds on the unit, so everyone knows kind of what's what's happening. Um, the nurses will invite families to participate in rounds as part of their morning assessment, um, and they will hand over one of the iPads to the family, and then everyone joins with uh, headsets to protect privacy and preserve sound quality. And both the nurse and the caregiver. Um, participate in, in rounds. Nursing will provide their running report. Parents will provide their perspective and ask questions. Um, and at the end, the nurse cleans the iPad and either goes to their next patient or hands it off to the next nurse to, 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 uh, to take their, their patient. How it works for the physician and uh, healthcare professionals um, is that they set up in assigned locations off the unit in conference rooms or personal offices. Um, if in the conference room, then it's physically distanced and masked. Um, they use personal devices or a Chio laptop to sign in to virtual family-centered rounds with their camera on. Um, and the senior logs into the team's Chio Zoom account and admits participants from the waiting room. Everyone is instructed to include their role uh, in their display name, which is really important so that the parents know who, who is on the Zoom meeting, who's, who's speaking, um, and who's participating in their care. Um, pharmacy and other health professionals will join daily uh, or as needed and can sign in based on the time their patient is being discussed. Um, adherence to the schedule, standardized timing and content really facilitates flow, but at the core teams can facilitate virtual family centered rounds as they would in person, though it does require some more explicit verbal cues. You know, now we're moving on to the next patient kind of thing so that everyone knows um, what's going on because you don't have the same uh, in-person physical cues that you otherwise would have. And with that, I'll hand it over to Melanie. Great, thank you, Catherine. Um, next slide, please, Ellen. Okay, so um, the process that Catherine described um, really took started about a year ago and from April to July 2020, we were lucky to have um, resources available to us to perform a fairly rapid um, improvement cycle following quality improvement methodology with um, you know, CHEO operational support to make that happen so that we could really start to not only improve our process, but also evaluate it to see if it was working and more, most importantly, what stakeholders thought of the whole thing. Um, so through a number of different uh, data gathering techniques, the first being surveys, um, we uh, surveyed all stakeholders uh, caregivers, patients, and healthcare professionals involved in the virtual family-centered rounds process to ask them some very simple questions around their satisfaction with the process um, and whether they were getting what they needed out of it. So as you'll see on the slide, um, from a healthcare professionals or a physician team, nursing team standpoint, 74% um, of the provider care teams were satisfied with the process. And at the end of virtual family centered rounds, 88% felt they had a good understanding of the patient's plan of care. On the patient and the caregiver side, we had an almost 80% satisfied or very satisfied rating uh, from caregivers. But I would say most importantly, 88% of caregivers felt like a valued partner in their child's health care and understood the plan of care, which I would argue is one of the most important parts of family-centered rounds. Mel, it's Joe Reisman yelling in. Um, is there any difference between the perception between nursing, allied health, and physicians? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, thanks, Joe. No worries. Um, 
I would say on average, the satisfaction ratings were quite similar ap across those groups. Uh, perhaps some of the most, uh, you're welcome. Perhaps some of the most surprising and also encouraging feedback we received was in our qualitative data. Um, and the, this slide really speaks to some of the feedback we received from patients and caregivers. Um, so we received comments like, um, patients and caregivers liked virtual rounds more than normal face-to-face -face rounds and should continue to do this all the time. They found them less intimidating and overwhelming. There's no large group standing at the bedside or outside in the hallway. Um, that may be quite, um, quite difficult for some patients and families, which, you know, as the care team, these are things we sometimes, I think, may not realize. Um, the, despite the virtualness, patients and families felt part of the team and they were happy that we were using this to achieve social distancing or physical distancing. One of the most surprising things we heard was by virtue of using these sorts of headsets, uh, patients and families were thrilled with the newfound privacy of their rounds. They were happy that their roommates or people roaming the hallways weren't able to overhear what the physician and the healthcare team was saying in regards to their care. And this was repeated by multiple uh, care providers, or sorry, by multiple caregivers and patients. Um, and finally, just to sort of round out the feedback, we heard various versions of this, but overall patients and caregivers were very thankful that CHEO has made it a priority to find ways to keep patients and families involved while still doing things safely. We also gathered a fair bit of quantitative data again during our pilot period from April to July 2020. Um, in fact, we, uh, we, our team and our auditors audited 1,783 rounds during this pilot period, and they measured all sorts of things, but I'll speak to two of, th two of those here. So mean rounding time really speaks to the amount of time that the care team is taking to discuss a patient during rounds, and the literature would support um, a 10 minute per patient um, average as something that we should all be striving for in our individual, each individual round. And um, do, some work done by Mark Zucker and Anne Rowan Leg back in 2014 on family center grounds did find that we were able to achieve this benchmark a lot of the time. So we wanted to see if this was also doable in this virtual version of family center grounds. And as you can see from the control chart, um, the process when we first started for mean rounding time was quite out of control. So you'll see that the tips of the graph going above the upper and lower control limits, but over time and over the pilot period, you'll see that the, the line gets a little bit, sticks around the mean a little bit more, and which means the process was trending towards statistical control. And so on average, our mean rounding time was 8.4 minutes per patient. And I would uh, also highlight that in, um, in July, the mean rounding time was actually under eight minutes per patient once we were a well-oiled machine. Uh, with respect to mean transition time, so this is the time it takes for uh, the, the wait time between patients. Um, we, our goal was to have this under four minutes and we were successful in, uh, in achieving this goal with a mean transition time of 2.9 minutes between patients. Um, so this is a process that we are really proud of. Um, and other than virtualizing the current process we had, this also presented an opportunity to, to tweak our current process and um, make it even more efficient uh, and, and overall improve it. So we were able to sort of re-standardize how, how family center grounds and virtually family center grounds are done, um, particularly with respect to the structure and timing of the rounds. We were able to develop a schedule for pharmacy involvement that allowed their involvement to be both more predictable and more regular. Um, improved nursing attendance, just to pause on this for a moment, um, as you saw through Catherine's um, discussion of how the actual process works, it is very much a nurse driven process. It is, it is the nurse who is bringing the iPads to the patients and the families and therefore uh, nursing engagement and nursing attendance is so important. Um, prior to virtual family center grounds, our physicians had retrospectively 
um, estimated nursing participation at about 65 to 70%, but we're happy to say that nursing participation increase in rounds increased to over 90% as part of the virtual family centered rounds process. We were able to achieve a process that was safe, secure, and confidential. We were able to reduce infection risk and um, reflecting on the number of patients and the number of uh, members of the rounding team during the pilot period, we estimate that we saved about $36,000 a month in PPE, which would uh, really translate from everyone gowning up and going into a room to discuss a patient, which is really the standard for family-centered care or family-centered rounds. But by virtualizing this process, we were able to save uh, quite a bit of money for the hospital. We do see some utility to this beyond COVID-19, and I'll discuss that in a moment. Um, and this has really resulted in interest from hospitals, children's and adult hospitals from across the country. Um, just to touch on some of the unanticipated benefits or surprising things about this, which some of which I've already discussed. So the privacy and the confidentiality piece is huge. There's been a, a fair bit of literature since the onset of the COVID pandemic around the, uh, the challenges associated with PPE and how this may, um, may hinder obviously nonverbal communication and communication overall. And with a virtual family-centered rounds process, particularly for the staff who is able to do this from their office, there's an opportunity for our patients and caregivers to see what we look like without a mask. And I will say that it is an incredibly rewarding experience to have a toddler uh, like grab at the tablet because they see your face for the first time in, you know, the 24 hours you've been providing their care. Um, we had a, a situation um, recently where a member, a resident member of a provider care team was on home isolation and that resident was actually able to participate in rounds from home uh, despite the home isolation and, and, and stay up to date with all of the patients uh, on the team, which we thought was a really neat benefit we hadn't really thought of. Um, the point about flexibility, and here comes Alex McKenzie used with permission. Um, so this is Alex McKenzie on his bicycle, uh, I assume coming to work and participating in family center grounds from afar, um, which, you know, we thought was, a, was a, again, totally unanticipated, but great, uh, great part of this that provides some additional flexibility, not only for staff, but for learners as discussed. And finally, this has been a great opportunity to share these lessons with other hospitals and other organizations nationally and uh, even internationally. So in terms of next steps for the Virtual Family Center Grounds project, so uh, based on our pilot data, we have prepared and are about to hit the submit button on a manuscript around this. Um, we have at this point um, started rallying and will hopefully be uh, implementing a rigorous process evaluation and a fulsome technology assessment over the next few months, um, which we're happy to say has had a ton of patient and family interest to be involved in this and a lot of support from our patients and families on both in the CHEO Patient Family Advisory Council and the CHEO RI Patient and Family Advisory Council. And then out of this, out of this formal evaluation, we hope to develop a toolkit, which allows us to really create a bit of a recipe for virtual family centered rounds that we can then disseminate to other hospitals who want to do this in their own institutions. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Ellen. Great. Thanks, uh, Mel and Catherine. So just a couple more slides just to round it out, and then we'll have time for questions. So hopefully we've shown you that um, CHEO is really a leader in virtual care delivery operational, and we've seen that as we've spoken to other hospitals. Um, it's been clear just how well we are doing things, which is great. And evaluation is already underway, as you've already seen uh, in these two clinical areas, but also several other clinical areas, mostly focusing on the individual experience, the caregiver, the patient, the provider. Um, also also some other outcomes, but evidence is really lacking in terms of patient outcomes, equity, quality, safety, cost effectiveness. So here we have this opportunity to really systematically evaluate, improve, and disseminate our work to improve pediatric care delivery overall. So we came up with this goal, um, which is to develop an evaluation structure for virtual care that aligns with the CHEO RI strategic plan and is integrated within CHEO's operational goals. And this is a project that is supported by our chief of staff, uh, Dr. Lindy Sampson, and Dr. Jason Berman from the RI. So our first step um, was to put together 
a team. And so I won't list everybody here, but hopefully you'll see some familiar faces. So we have um, a strong team with representation from several clinical areas, also representation from the CRU, the RI. We have expertise in um, quality improvement, social determinants of health, information services, human factors design. Um, we also have already had a lot of engagement with our family advisory council. We're just waiting on the final designation of who our main representative will be. Um, what we've done to date, we've, we meet every two weeks. We've had a couple meetings so far and we've decided on our deliverables and our approach to an evaluation framework. In terms of that approach, um, Basically, the American Academy of Pediatrics has put out a publication uh, with a proposed way to evaluate virtual care, which focuses on four domains, health outcomes, health delivery, individual experience, and program implementation. Um, and we have critically appraised that together. We like it, but we notice some gaps. And so we want to work on revising that, modifying it, making it more uh, better for CHEO to use and better for Canadian users. And we want to incorporate some of the domains that have been, well, all of the domains that have been identified locally um, from Health Quality Ontario's domains of quality care. So we're working on a framework um, that incorporates those things. Um, if we fast forward to what would success look like, and hopefully we'll be back here in a year or two to tell you what we've done. Um, but basically we want uh, to have a CHEO virtual care hub that is recognized certainly internally, but ideally also provincially and nationally as really the go-to place for virtual care implementation, evaluation, and innovation. These are some of the examples of the deliverables that we hope to have, um, but ultimately really improving healthcare delivery systems and improved health outcomes, including but not limited to patient satisfaction. And we also wanna take a deeper dive into the cost savings, not just individual, but also on the healthcare system, environmental cost savings as well. So ultimately, we hope that the utilization of this framework that we develop will be used to obtain results that will really impact patient outcomes, inform service design, um, and support requests for funding. So with our final slide, we like this quote, which says, you can't use this technology, show people it exists, demonstrate that it is actually really convenient and positive. And then when we are able to return to some sort of normality, say, well, you saw the future, you've seen all the technology, now we're just going to take it away. Obviously that's not going to happen. There's no question that virtual care is a disruptor, but hopefully you've seen today how we've adapted to uniquely um, working with virtual care in this new context to de deliver care effectively. Um, the, and, and really looking at virtual care, not as its own thing, but just a component of the overall care we provide, which is the business that we're in. And the remaining question is really how we will use this new tool to build a sustainable and effective healthcare delivery system in the future after the pandemic. And with that, we're happy uh, to take any questions. Wow. All right. Well, that was truly an amazing presentation. Um, I just want to take a few moments to reflect on what we've just heard before um, signing or uh, handing it over to questions. So, you know, Jim, Jim kicked this off for us, really providing us with a context that reminded us that virtual care is a great technology for us to enable us to deliver on our business, which is, as Ellen just reminded us, is the business of caring. So it's not about the technology, it's about the caring, and this technology really allows us to do this better. And, and what we've heard is really a great example of this. Ellen provided highlights on how she and others have worked with the EPIC team to really develop this opportunity to make virtual care a real possibility for us and how she has been overseeing this work, um, which has really been fantastic. And then uh, Malabat and Malbuva and Catherine Delude described how they built on these opportunities that we've been, you know, really creating that foundation and working on um, and really helped operationalize those in specific clinical areas to make use of provincial opportunities um, and really enhance our patient care offerings. And I think the most important part reminding us, you know, we're an academic health, health science center um, showing us how we've done all this and we're, we're bringing scholarship into these endeavors and really being leaders. And I think that makes us really incredible, makes, us, makes me feel very proud to be a part of this and to be witnessing this. So thank you so much for all that you've done and, and for this fantastic presentation. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to, um, to uh, questions for any of those that, that were able to wait and not interrupt the presentation because they, they had to ask their question right away. 
Um, but thank you, Joe. I know you always have good questions. Um, so if anyone um, has any questions or comments, please. Thanks write. for the reprimand, Mona. <laughs> we expect nothing less from you, Joe. <laughs> um, so does anyone have any, there's been lots of very positive comments in the chat, uh, but if anyone has any questions or comments they want to bring forward, um, please raise your hand or go ahead and speak. Hi, it, it's Alec McKenzie, the cyclist. Uh, um, Mel, uh, hi, guys. Great, great, great talk. Uh, I'm loving the future. helmet, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for. Uh, um, Mala, have, can we track out the kids that we're seeing virtually to see that their natural sequelae is similar, better, or worse than kids that come in? Uh, is there any way, in addition to getting patient satisfaction, uh, family satisfaction, a sense of is there medical disposition impacted at all by doing it remotely? And yeah, so it's, it's, a, a it's, a, it's a great question and it is something that we are tracking. So we track the 72 hour bounce back visits to the emergency department from virtual care. Mm -hmm. um, there's a portion of patients that are referred into the hospital by virtual care, but there are those that um, choose to go to the emergency department after receiving virtual care. We're about to, um, publish a manuscript on this. And um, it shows that we're actually very good at deciding who needs to go into the emergency department. Um, there, I have to, I can't really pull the numbers off the top of my head, but there were a very small number of admissions um, from that were referred in from virtual care and only one admission um, in this past year uh, from an ED bounce back visit. Wow. Yeah, pretty good. And, um, you know, a lot, the majority of patients who bounce back um, to the in person emergency department are for febrile illness. So, um, I mean, we can understand that we refer a lot of these kids into the department for testing for cath urine in the young kids. But um, if the fever goes on for some time, I mean, we can understand the, the family's um, concern and hesitancy, I guess. I should Great, have pulled thanks. up those uh, exact numbers for you. Sorry, Alec. No, no worries. You can loop back. Okay, great. So uh, a few time for a few more questions. Uh, Joe Reisman. Thanks, Mona. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Jim, Catherine, Melanie, Ellen, everybody on the IS team for really enabling transformative change at, at CHEO. Again, as in my comments, this is the most one of the most exciting things I've seen, and COVID has certainly been the burning platform for change that will hopefully be sustained. Um, Jim, uh, first question, I have two comments. Well, first question, uh, we should, um, or are we uh, working with uh, tech firms, possibly in the region, maybe Waterloo, to enhance the amount of stuff we can do virtually? For example, I know Lillian Lai and eConsults has looked at working with some uh, 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 people in technology and stethoscopes, for example. I mean, we only need to kick it off up a notch a little bit more in the virtual. I've done telemedicine uh, stethoscopes in the past. They need work for lung sounds, but I mean, this is a huge opportunity as well. You know, whether it's incorporated in an app, you know, a, a oximeter at home, a stethoscope that we can use over an app, uh, you know, a, a spirometer that could be used over an app, that the, the possibilities are endless. And since Chio is so, um, um, you know, leading in this area, it'd be nice to see we keep we keep up the momentum and not and not let others overtake us or that we work collaborative with others. And the other thing is for advocacy, you know, are we making sure that the really poor folk that aren't connected are having opportunities? For example, we could advocate for e-links and women's shelters and places where people don't really often have access to e e-medicine, I'm just worried about the very uh, 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 compromised and unconnected folk not being able to take advantage of this. But anyway, just two ideas, sorry. Yeah, I think the answer to both those questions are actual um, other rounds. Um, they're, they're, they're not sort of uh, necessarily quick or short, but um, we are working with other um, um, uh, groups with regards to how both we can operationally provide better, uh, better care um, from a virtual perspective, I, just as a quick example, I mentioned Kaiser Permanente before. Uh, Kaiser has a system set up. I mean, it's a large operational system. They have over 38 hospitals um, 
where if you're a family doc and you're in with a patient, if you need to connect to a specialist, you can do it immediately through a virtual visit. Mm -hmm. And they've been able to decrease the number of specialty consultations by 40% by doing that. So they think it frees up time for the specialist to support the family docs, but also for the specialist to actually uh, focus more on what they need to focus on for complex uh, uh, medically fragile fragile patients. So there's lots of uh, opportunity around that. I, I, Ellen and I have had lots of discussion around the uh, equity and social determinants of health with regards to the provision of care. And I've had that with Karen as well. Uh, Karen and I uh, are, are leading the sort of um, strategic approach from the hospital for this. Uh, we really believe that there is an equity issue that we need to address and we are looking at it. Um, but the first thing we need to do is actually get the data to sort of show where that is and where those areas are that we need to focus on. But that is definitely one of the priorities for us. Okay, so we are at time. I know there's Thanks, two more Jim. questions. Um, I'm gonna allow that to continue and then um, and then we'll sign off. So if anyone that needs to leave, please go ahead. Um, Martin, uh, you, you're up next and then Tom will be the final question. Yeah, thanks Mona. It's a quick one, but I just, anyway, congratulations to the team for coming so far so quickly in this area. Um, I just wondered about sustainability of funding. Um, you know, clearly this depends on the direction that the government goes as far as funding visits. I mean, do you have 100%. any, you didn't touch on it at all in the presentation. What do you think the chances are that the government is gonna continue to fund 50% of our visits as virtual care visits? Um, yeah, and I just very quickly, um, while we've changed to 50% of our in-person visits to virtual visits, I, I would actually challenge that 50% of the activity we were doing before COVID even started was virtual. So two-way message, and it was, but it was asynchronous. So like, this is more, we're talking about synchronous virtual care provision. But I, I think that's absolutely right, Martin, that uh, funding is going to be probably the big lever for this. And, and we definitely need to advocate to maintain the funding uh, um, to to be able to provide the be able to provide the service because I, I think the service will melt away quite quickly um, if there's no uh, if there's no funding for it. So you'll have to let us know what we can do as a group to uh, to advocate for this because it has been fantastic. Absolutely. And I think I think one of the important things is that you know right before the pandemic the pilot where OTN was allowing for funding through the home video visits that was expanded to be available to everybody and then we had an agreement with OTN saying we could use Zoom instead of OTN to do that. So already we had that allowance for video visits, which is why, why I talk about video visits being you know, more sticky and sustainable because I can't imagine that they turn back and change their mind about something they, about something that they you know, had allowed before the pandemic. I feel that the telephone visits might be harder to sustain um, and, and certainly still have a role. So it'd be nice if there is some, but I think we're already on the right path in that we have streamlined how we all do video visits. It's right within Epic. So, because that was really a barrier, um, you know, logging onto a different system and not having it right in, in our system. Thanks. Okay, great. Final question, Tom, hopefully it's a brief one. Thanks Mona for letting the rounds uh, extend a little bit. I think for the past year, uh, we've seen this incredible team take a whole bunch of it's impossibles and suddenly make them happen. And, and I see three more it's impossibles that I'm hoping uh, this group will make possible in the next year. Um, the first is extending EPIC to, to pediatricians in the community. Uh, I, I think there's enormous benefits to that. Uh, the, the second is giving us the kind of free wheeling access between us and TOH. Uh, that we currently have between us and sick kids. Uh, and the final one is the opportunity for, for specialties to park patients in the consultation list who aren't CHEO patients, but who we're discussing with Nunavut or Timmins or whatever. I, I know that functionality already exists for Epic and Go at GOSH, and I'm hoping it'll come here. Okay, who wants that one? Jim, Ellen? Um, yeah, so uh, we, we've had lots of conversations about extending Epic out into the community. Uh, uh, there, there are some technical and financial difficulties with doing that, but that would be a, a dream by me. Uh, um, you know, we, we are trying to make the most integrated system for uh, sharing pediatric information uh, that, that we possibly can. 
Um, but uh, I think we're going to need provincial external help to be able to, to, to do that, or, or, or the will of the community to, to, to want to shift to Epic, for instance, as a provider. But I, I will say that we are doing lots of work and I think I'm hoping that Ocean um, uh, is going to be supported as a platform, uh, a portal, which we can actually communicate between end providers, uh, EMRs, and, and that's looking like an opportunity for us. So stay tuned for that because we may be able to link much better than what we're currently, currently doing. Thank you. Okay, well with that, thank you all for your uh, staying on for this additional time. Fantastic work and we really look forward to where we go next. Thank you all. Have Thanks a great for having day. us. Thank you. Thank you.